Good morning. It's Thursday, the 22nd of August, and this is Govind Raj Ati Raj, headquartered and broadcasting and streaming from Mumbai on most days, but presently in transit. The take, the price of reducing friction. A little over four years ago, just before the pandemic appended our lives, India's Trade Minister Piyush Goyal went after Amazon, saying that they were not doing a great favor to India when they invested a billion dollars. His argument then seemed to be that Amazon was making losses, presumably by undercutting prices. So they had to fund that loss and that in turn was their investment. And thus, it was not an investment in the true sense. At least that's what I understood of what he was trying to say. And on Wednesday, more than four years hence, he said almost exactly the same thing. In the context, however, of a different claim that e-commerce could lead to social disruption and then targeted Amazon once again. Why say the same thing four years on, I wonder? Anyway, the minister did say he did not want to wish away e-commerce, but rather argued for its orderly growth and was thinking of some 100 million retailers, which is, of course, the politically correct thing to say. Anyway, any predatory pricing, including by electric motorcycles, creates a disruption in the market and affects other players and sometimes is not in the best interests of all players. Now, the statement by the minister came in the context of the launch of a report by a reasonably government-friendly think tank, which actually seemed to argue the opposite. The report, authored by Pehle India, is run by Dr. Rajiv Kumar, which he set up in 2013 before leaving it to join as the vice chairman of Niti Aayog, the government planning body, and then return to Pehle India, his think tank. Now, the report says that online vendors have generated almost 16 million jobs in India, including 3.5 million for women, with about 1.8 million retail enterprises participating in e-commerce activity. The report assessing the net impact of e-commerce on employment and consumer welfare in India was launched by the Trade Minister Piyush Goel himself. Now, e-commerce, according to this report, has been a key driver of employment generation and on an average, online vendors employ 54% more people and are almost twice the number of female employees compared to offline vendors. The report also noted that two of the most widely recognized contributions of e-commerce penetration in the retail sector are growth in employment and improvements in consumer welfare. Importantly, it also claimed that rather than displacing physical markets, e-commerce was expanding into new territories like Tier 3 cities and then said that more than two-thirds of the online vendors interviewed experienced an increase in online sales value and profits in the past year and 58% saw an increase in both. That is, increase in online sales value as well as profits. Now, there are other data points from this survey which suggest that people spend a lot of time on e-commerce platforms even if they may not necessarily buy anything. So, there are a few questions that arise out of all of this. Firstly, it's not clear whether the minister is attacking only foreign e-commerce platforms like Amazon or Flipkart, which is owned by Walmart or domestic ones. Because predatory pricing is not the preserve of the overseas e-commerce companies by any stretch. Indian companies with overseas venture funding mostly, or for that matter, even small investor money, thanks to some recent IPOs, have been doing precisely the same thing. Now, you could argue the trends are being set by the Flipkarts and Amazons, but equally, there has been a benefit to sellers and buyers of those products. What consumers really love about e-commerce is obviously the lack of friction, which is more apparent and evident in the Indian context, apart from the other benefits, which is the ability, for example, to scour millions of products and benefit from wider choice. Now, the reduction of friction in financial services, to use an analogy, and transactions has created its own set of problems, as we can see, with more people, for example, snapping up loans, maybe to buy products or maintain their lifestyles. E-commerce, at the very basic level, at least in my understanding, is a logistics enabler and a reducer of friction. Now, the question is, do we want to reduce friction or manage it? More than that, it's not clear to me at this point that offline is suffering, except in some cases, from the e-commerce onslaught. Even if it is, and data is scarce, the corresponding jobs and opportunities created by, let's say, the ability to make products that can be directly exported have also increased for Indian entrepreneurs. Or products that address, for example, the beauty segment in India where there was a latent demand which e-commerce seemingly has better navigated. Now, whether all of this has been profitable is a different question. Now, if there is a tilt in either direction, which is that it's causing harm or causing benefit, we must have much better data to make a case. The minister, for example, pointed out that countries like Switzerland have controlled the growth of e-commerce, possibly. But there is no comparison, I feel, with a large and logistically complex country like India, where delivery, for example, let's say products from one small city in one corner of the country to another small city in another corner of the country is best perhaps delivered by e-commerce companies. Either way, it comes back to more granular data and understanding on who's benefited and not since we are, well, perhaps a decade into the intensive phase of e-commerce. 
If Amazon is bringing in investments to fund its losses, that is a loss for Amazon and gain for the consumer, as it's been with all the funds that have come into and perhaps evaporated in the e-commerce sector. If the cost of reducing friction is too high, then eventually enterprises will be forced to raise prices and reduce their offerings. And if consumers still genuinely want to pay more, they will. And this has happened to some extent or even a large extent in e-commerce in developed markets where firms like Amazon have raised prices, including to account for taxes and consumers seemingly continue to pay. The other point is that cheap funding will not last forever, whether from venture capital or from small investors, given, as I referred to earlier, the number of new IPOs in this space. Eventually, economics must decide the fate of this space. And that brings us to the top themes of the day. The stock markets seek direction once again. Gold prices edge back but stay in record territory. Is the PSU stock bull run over for now? Do you have to get an income tax clearance certificate before catching the next international flight? This is the Core Report with Govindraj Atiraj. The stock markets were tepid for most of Wednesday's trading session with no major triggers to respond to. While there were movements in some sectors like consumer products, there was nothing significant in or during the trading day. The BSC Sensex ended at 80,905, up 102 points, and the Nifty 50 was up 71 points to 24,770. According to Business Standard, Titan, Asian Paints, ITC, HUL, Bajaj, FinServe, Nestle, India, Adani Ports, and JSW Steel were amongst the top Sensex gainers rising in the range of 1% to 2.5%. No clear indications within that, though. Elsewhere, the rupee dropped on Wednesday to log its worst single-day performance in nearly two months as dollar demand from importers and foreign banks wiped off nearly all the rupees' gains from earlier this week, according to Reuters. Rupee closed at 83 rupees 92 paise against the US dollar, down about 0.16% from its previous close of 83 rupees 87 paise its sharpest single-day decline since June 26. So it would appear that the surge we saw was more of a one-off event rather than representative of any secular climb, even if marginally, since the rupee usually moves in a sharp band. Analysts that the core report has been speaking to in the last month or even more have been saying that the rupee is set to depreciate further, even if slightly, against the dollar. On Tuesday, the rupee had hit a two-week high of 83 rupees 75 paise. Elsewhere, oil is still holding below $78 a barrel or around $77.90 a barrel as the Middle East tension issue still remains steady. Gold falls back. Gold prices fell back after hitting another record as eyes are now turning to a speech by US Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell later this week, which could provide clues specific or otherwise on when interest rates could come. Bullion climbed as high as $2,531 an ounce, taking this year's gain to more than 22% before it pulled back a little bit, according to Bloomberg. Powell's address on Friday at the annual Jackson Hole Symposium in Wyoming will be closely analyzed for clues about the Federal Reserve's thinking on widely expected rate cuts, which are supposed to happen next month. All of this will, of course, benefit gold because lower interest rate means gold becomes more attractive for its capital appreciation. The PSU stock dream hits a speed breaker. For perhaps a year or more, several veteran analysts the core report has been speaking to have been highlighting that the PSU stock rally is overheated and overvalued and how. At every turn, the market and thus mostly retail investors have responded by sending these stocks up further. Now, institutional investors have attempted to climb onto the bandwagon too with sector-specific mutual funds, for example, for defence, which again is mostly public sector units. An interesting report in the Economic Times now says that the multi-billion dollar rally in PSU stocks is finally taking a break. It says that at least 30 high-flying Sarkari or government-owned stocks are now entering the bear market zone. It quotes the example of defence public sector unit GRSE, which remains a six-bagger in two years, but has fallen 37% from its 52-week peak, while BEML, or Bharat Earth Movers, is down 31% and Cochin Shipyard, 30%. Other favourites like Mazgon, Dock Ship Builders, Bharat Dynamics, IRCON, IRFC, RITES and Hudco are also down 20% from their recent peaks. Last week, ICICI Security said GRSE shares could fall up to 74%, Mazgon Dock could fall up to 77%. 
ICICI Securities, of course, in general has been calling out overheating in the market, though in most cases, no one listens to them. Or perhaps no one listens to anyone in a raging bull market, including for sectors like this. But the Economic Times report also says mutual funds have sold stakes in some 28 PSU stocks in June, and foreign institutional investors were also bearish on 30 such stocks. The interesting thing, of course, is that the boom was a bet on government spending, which is not really changing as I can see, but also a strong bet or rather a bet on a strong BJP government returning to power. The BJP government is, of course, back, though in a diluted way, though it's not clear to me why the markets would then stop betting on PSU stocks the same way. All of this is not to say that PSU stocks were bad in concept, but many of them were good buys actually for their businesses, operations and surprisingly governance. The issue has been always about valuation. And of course, the prospect that prices have been driven high because of low floating stock. I reached out to veteran market analyst Ambarish Baliga, who has been cautioning on PSU stocks, among other areas where he's found valuation stretch. And I began by asking him why this re-rating was happening now. Every multi-bagger, whether it's a sector or a stock, goes through a particular cycle. And the cycle starts when it's very undervalued, undiscovered, and then people slowly start discovering it. And that's when the interest starts in it. And then because of the momentum, at the same time, because of the sort of performance, because surely the performance has to improve, based on that, they start becoming multi-bagger. And then a lot more investors get involved. And that momentum continues. As long as someone calls the shot and says that, yes, it's too overvalued. And that's exactly what has happened as of now. And because of which we have seen a correction. But this correction is nothing compared to the sort of a move which we have seen in the last about a year and a half, two years. A couple of stocks, for example, if I can talk about the financials, you have the profitability going up about 4x. But the stock has gone up 20x. I mean, how do you justify that? Unless, of course, you expect this sort of a move in the profitability to continue. I mean, every two years becoming 4x. And that's not really possible. I mean, unless you're in a business which is completely on, like, out of the world. So somewhere, I think, I mean, if a person calls it an uh, emperor without clothes, I think that's exactly what has happened now. Right. So a couple of questions. So first is, are you seeing anything within the trends? For example, let's say a company like Dredging Corporation, Cochin Shipyard, Mazgon Dock. Now, these are all part of, let's say, the shipping and uh, logistics space. Uh, do you feel that within PSUs too, there is some selective uh, selection happening? Uh, no, I suppose uh, it is more on the on the defense part where we are seeing a major correction. I think one of the reasons is that the market in the last one and a half, two years has discounted uh, the order flows. And the order flows have been stupendous. I mean, no denying that fact. And if you look at the order flows, quite a few of them are filled up for the next possibly six to eight years, 10 years. Now the question comes up is when you already have so much of orders, uh, the future orders, will that be as strong because no one will give you orders for delivery after 12 or 15 years? If that's too far away. Number two, I mean, would you be able to execute it? Here, the market is assuming that execution will be flawless. And we have seen in the past that even large companies, I mean, even something, I mean, something like a LNT, I mean, we have seen them faltering on execution. And that has to be one of the things to be looked at. You have a whole sector moved up like this. I mean, what can go wrong with execution? And that was never discounted. It's only now that people are talking about it. And now we have also seen some of the uh, I mean, CEOs talking about it. Like, for example, uh, HAL's CEO, I mean, he spoke about the execution issues. And at the same time, you really can't be doubling or tripling your capacity overnight. Because it's, it's not a question of getting the CapEx done. Yes, I mean, they can raise money for CapEx. But where do you have the skilled manpower? You can't get them overnight. So all these things will take time. And the market hasn't discounted all these issues. So suddenly when you have more and more people talking about things like these, that's when the market realizes that, yes, I think it's too overvalued. I mean, three or four years back, I'm not talking of two years back, three or four years back, I mean, these stocks were quoting at possibly 7x, 7p, 7 earnings. Today, quite a few of them are quoting at 10 to 12 times turnover. Forget earnings. You're talking 10 to 12 20 times turnover. Very, very difficult to justify, but when momentum is there in the market, you have to flow with that. But then you need to be prudent enough to keep booking profits at every level. You need to utilize the opportunity. You really can't go against the market, but you should be aware of where things can go wrong. 
Right. So what you've done is really analyze many of these companies from a fundamental point of view. I mean, asking questions about the business capability and ability to deliver and all that. But the investors who invest in these have been following perhaps some Pied Piper, real or virtual, who it could be one person or many persons. So how do you address that? And could that change? No, let's see. Uh, unlike some of the past bull runs that you've seen in the 90s, there was a Pied Piper, no doubt. But here, if you say a Pied Piper, it's, it's the retail. And the amount of money retail has been pouring in, whether directly or through mutual funds, I mean, has been so huge that even FI selling doesn't really matter. And what I've seen, especially in uh, this bull run, like once the momentum catches on, then those stocks clearly become multi-baggers. And in normal scenario, you would normally see a multi-bagger over a couple of years. A stock becomes a multi-bagger because of the performance over possibly four years, five years. I mean, here we are seeing multi-baggers in six months and one year. And these are not exceptions. I mean, you you have lots of shares which have become multi-baggers. I think the last note which I had was, I think, about 700 to 800 multi-baggers out of those 3,000 companies which are quoted. And if you're looking at the Nifty 500, which are those top 500 companies, out there we had somewhat 60 or 70 multi-baggers. And these multi-baggers I'm talking of within a period of a year. So this is unnatural. But then... Like I said, you really can't go against the market. You can't tell people to sell off your portfolio and get out because after you're sold off, you've seen I mean, those stocks which have become 10 baggers have become 20 baggers. Right. Yeah. So uh, let me ask you the other question then, uh, Ambarish. So, you know, uh, there is a flood of money flowing into the market. Now, obviously, at various points, people try and put up a dam. I mean, it could be in the form of statements made by people like you saying that this is not. But if the flood continues as it is, all that will happen is that the water will move into a new direction and go and start filling up other stocks, so to speak. Do you see that happening? For example, if now we are seeing a reduction in prices in all these PSU and defense stocks, people may well move into something else which is equally... Which is, which is what has happened already. I mean, if you see the last six months or the last nine months, we have seen a lot of sector rotations happening. But then, uh, see, uh, let me tell you that uh, this liquidity has always been there. It's not a new liquidity that is created. The difference now is that the, this liquidity, instead of flowing into some other investments, bank FTs and all that, is flowing into the markets. And this liquidity will, will flow in as long as the confidence is there. I mean, as long as you're making money, the liquidity flows in. The day you realize that, no, I mean, every extra rupee I'm putting in has been making losses, that is when the confidence gets shaken. That is when the liquidity stops or reduces. And that reduction of liquidity or stopping of liquidity is enough for the markets to start falling further. Because this market at every higher level requires that much more of liquidity to maintain. Not just move up, just to maintain it requires that much more of liquidity. And if there's a reduction of liquidity because of lack of confidence, then the whole cycle which we are looking at, the, the virtuous cycle which was there earlier, money coming in because of which the market goes up and because of which again, the, again more money comes in. That cycle starts reversing. And when that cycle reverses, then we say there's panic. Then we'll, the, uh, I mean, after that, we look for reasons as to why that panic happened. But then this is what has, I mean, history has shown us. Every time this happens, the story could be different. The players could be different. But the main story remains the same. Right. Ambrish, very cautionary and uh, important uh, words at this point. Thank you so much for joining me. Most welcome. My pleasure. A new tax certificate before you leave the country. The government's Ministry of Finance has said that all Indian nationals are not required to obtain an Income Tax Clearance Certificate or ITCC prior to departing the country, contrary to what recent reports claimed. Now, those reports were, of course, based on the lack of clarity in the budget pronouncements, which was last month, which had said that individuals domiciled in India should clear all tax dues and get a clearing certificate before departing the country, which obviously gave the impression, including on various WhatsApp groups, that anyone traveling abroad would first have to run to the tax department to get a clearance certificate that their dues were in order before reaching the airport. Another 1970s feeling of which we have quite a few now. So the clarification is that this modification, which includes the application of the Prevention of Money Laundering Act, does not require all individuals to obtain that tax clearance certificate. The CBDT or the Central Board of Direct Taxes has actually specified that the tax clearance certificate under Section 230 1A of the Act may be required to be obtained by persons domiciled in India only when there are financial irregularities involved and their presence is required in an investigation 
and there are direct tax arrears exceeding 10 lakh rupees which have not been stayed by any authority which would mean a court. Now, there is more to this which goes in various possible ways, I must say. I reached out to noted tax expert Dinesh Kanabar, founder and CEO of Dhruva Advisors, and I began by asking him to take us through the fine print and also how he was interpreting the broad directive and more importantly, how it could go. Before the Union Budget of 2024, Section 231, Capital A, contained a provision that any person leaving India who has got outstanding demand either under Income Tax Act, Wealth Tax Act, Gift Tax Act, Expenditure Tax, etc., can be called upon by the assessing officer to obtain a tax clearance certificate at the time of leaving the country. And the word uses that you have to give the purpose of visit, etc., etc. That means that it need not be leaving the country for good, but even for a visit. Now, this section has been there for several, several years on the Income Tax Act. In 2004, the government came up with a circular to say that the requirement of obtaining a tax clearance certificate arises in two situations. One is where a person is involved in serious financial irregularity and his presence is necessary in investigation of cases under Income Tax Act, etc. Or that a person has arrears of rupees 10 lakhs for direct taxes and against him, the demand has not been stayed. So if there is an open demand, you have not paid, nor have you obtained a stay. In such a situation, Section 231A applies. And going is important to note that this is not automatic, meaning if these two situations arise, namely that either there is a grave financial irregularity or there is demand of more than 10 lakh rupees, then the assessing officer with the approval of the commissioner has to issue a notice to say that this person cannot leave without obtaining income tax clearance certificate. That has been the existing law prior to 2024. The change which was brought about by the Finance Act now of 2024 is that they have included one more law, which is PMLA, so Prevention of Money Laundering Act. So apart from the Income Tax Act, of course, there is no wealth tax, there is no gift tax, there is no expenditure tax. So apart from income tax, if there is anything to do with PMLA and again, if these two conditions are fulfilled, that is either there is an accusation of grave financial irregularity for investigation of which you are needed or there is demand of more than 10 lakhs, which has not been stayed. Then if the officer says that you cannot leave, then you have to obtain a tax clearance certificate. Right. So this means that the certificate has to be acquired only if that notice were to first come to you from the income tax department. Am I understanding correctly? The office, the income tax office has to write to say that you gentlemen cannot now leave the country without obtaining tax clearance certificate. Presumably at that time, you will also intimate the immigration authorities. Every person files a tax return along with the tax return. You are also required to give your passport number. So, presumably at that time, you will also write to the immigration saying so and so person is the person against whom we have issued such a notice. So, there is no automatic requirement at all. The requirement arises only and only when the tax office issues a specific notice that in respect of this person, one of these two conditions is satisfied and therefore this person cannot leave the country without obtaining income tax clearance certificate. Okay, so I'll just come back to the, the practical side of it. But you're also saying, therefore, that every passenger who travels overseas does not, therefore, have to present a certificate saying that he or she paid taxes and so on. Front at all. Because that was the interpretation of the way, I think, at least in maybe pub, in the public eye. There is no room for interpretation. The section, and I'll, I'll read the provision from the section itself, basically says that provided that no income tax authority shall make it necessary for a person who is domiciled in India to obtain a certificate under this section unless he records the reason therefore and obtains prior approval of the principal chief commissioner or chief commissioner of income tax. So first of all, an income tax officer has to come to that conclusion. He has to pass an order to that effect and that order has to be done with the prior approval of the Commissioner of Income Tax, Chief Commissioner or the Principal Chief Commissioner. 
And what is the aspect of PMLA, that's prevention of money laundering, being added to this law? What does that actually signify? Until now, it was only if that there were proceedings against you under that Income Tax Act that the officer could pass the order. Now, even if there are proceedings against you under PMLA and there is a serious financial irregularity for which you are needed, he can pass the order. So, PMLA was not one of the laws for which he could have passed such an order. Now, PMLA is also one of the laws for which he could pass this order. So, how does that change? I mean, no, I'm because I'm trying to understand if if there is a 10 lakh rupee outstanding as a, as a, or a demand. No, it, it's actually very, very simple. There is nothing complicated. So, today, if there is a demand under Income Tax Act, Gift Tax Act, Wealth Tax or Expenditure Tax, and none of the later three acts are there. But let's assume that there was a demand under Income Tax or Wealth Tax. Only then he could issue to say more than 10 lakhs is due. Now, if there is a demand under PMLA also, he can do that. That's all. Nothing else. Okay. So now the practical question. In your understanding of cases that are such cases, how many cases do you feel or is it a common thing for people to be one having 10 lakh uh, demands in their personal capacity, which is what I'm assuming it is. And second is the addition of PMLA, will that increase the number of cases or what could it be? So even today, individuals have demands running into not lakhs but crores of rupees because tax office makes an addition and then you are disputing that addition. However, it is not that every demand is a challenge. It is a demand which has not been stayed which is a challenge. So if an officer makes an addition and you do not apply for a stay or he refuses to grant you a stay, that means the demand is yet and now payable. If somebody refuses a stay, then you can go to the commissioner, you can go to a tribunal, you can go to a court to ask for a stay. But if there is no stay and you are leaving, then the presumption is that there is a financial due and you are running away from the country. So this is sort of trying to protect the interest of revenue. PMLA is a recent act compared to Income Tax Act. And as of today, there are not too many cases under PMLA. But it has been seen, Govind, that in the recent past, it is the tendency of the tax office that in every time there is an income tax addition, there is also a PMLA angle in what? To say here is an attempt to launder money, whatever else in the circumstances. So, as I said, there are two conditions. Either that there is a financial irregularity and to investigate that, your presence is necessary. So, one of the challenges would be that under Income Tax Act to say there is a financial irregularity and your presence is necessary may be difficult because it's one thing to say there is a demand. Another thing to say that the demand is because of a financial irregularity. I would believe that in cases of PMLA, it will be easier for the tax office to allege that there is a financial irregularity. Okay, so do you feel that a lot of people will now have to ensure that they are compliant in some way or will the effort increase because then you are running to the court to get a stay because you already have these demands out there. So I'm just wondering, I mean, let's say X number of people, including those who run businesses and so on, who travel frequently, how many of them could be potentially affected in the manner in which it is likely to get rolled out? So, uh, Govind, you are asking me for a number, but maybe the way to look at it is slightly differently. The question is that until now, the income tax office has not been using these provisions very frequently. If they now start doing it, all that the officer has to do is that every time he invokes and sends you a condition and says, I'm accusing you of PMLA, simultaneously he will go to the commissioner, get an order and say, since I'm investigating you under PMLA, I'm hereby passing an order under 231A. So it is not the number of cases that is important, Govind. If that was so, the number of people impacted could be very few. The problem is that if the income tax office makes it a practice, that every time I accuse somebody of PMLA and whether PMLA is applicable or not may actually be decided much later. But in the meantime, I will just issue this notice that you are covered by PMLA and by the way, there is a financial irregularity and therefore, when do you leave, please obtain ITCC. And if that happens, then you could be under a grave situation. Got it. So anyway, I think so. The, uh, what I would take away from this is that most people, uh, at least let's say salaried professionals and so on, I mean, are definitely not affected by this or unlikely to be affected. Business man would be. Right. Right, Mr. Kanabat. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you.
That was The Core Report with me, Govind Raj Ethiraj. Do stay connected with more of our coverage at The Core. You can check out our website or sign up to our newsletter for our exclusive stories, one in-depth feature a day on www.thecore.in. Do also track us on LinkedIn, where we usually post synopses or extracts of our top stories and interviews. We would love your feedback on how we can make business more interesting and relevant, including, of course, India's vibrant manufacturing sector. So write to us at feedback at the core.in. And thank you once again for listening. <laughs>